Welcome to Prairie Pulse. I'm Matt O'Lean sitting in for John Harris. Our guest today for the full half hour is the new president at the University of North Dakota, Mark Kennedy. Mark, thanks for being here. Good to be with you, Matt. Uh, first of all, we'll get a lot of issues to talk about. You're very busy in Grand Forks these days, but tell folks first a bit about yourself, your background, where you're from originally, and how you got to UND. I was born in Benson. I grew up early in Murdoch, Minnesota, in southwest Minnesota, but then really got to high school at Pequot Lakes High School. I went to St. John's, off to Michigan, a 25-year career in business at companies like Pillsbury, today's Macy's, Accenture, three terms in Congress, uh, and now academia. I came from teaching at Johns Hopkins and George Washington University. And intriguingly, even though I'm a fourth-generation Minnesotan, I'm also the third generation right. of my family to live in North Dakota. So Debbie and I, Debbie's from Hawley, Debbie and I both feel right at home. And what got you interested in applying for this job? I guess, you know, you were, at, you were out east, what, what got you interested, even though, you know, you do have roots back here, but what, uh, did they come calling? Were you interested? How did that happen? Uh, I, I was interested because if you look between Minneapolis and Seattle, I think UND, University of North Dakota, is ideally positioned to be the best university in that region. We have strength in a lot of areas that are important to our future. You know, our medical school and all of our health professions are going to be in increasing demand, and we have a lot of expertise as to how we apply those in rural areas. In the energy, we have both the skills to help extract energy in a, with advanced techniques, but also carbon capture to make sure that we're addressing climate concerns as well. In unmanned aviation, building on our strong aviation background at the university, I think that could be tr as transformative as the iPhone. So you combine it with all the other areas of strength we have on campus, a rich, diverse group of talents that are focused on discovery, we can have a huge impact on this state and the region. So you're new to the job, a lot going on, we're gonna get to a lot of the things going on, but how's the adjustment been so far for you? It's been, it's been great. Uh, I think there have been a, a number of sort of challenges getting rolled down the way that we've had to pick up and address in addition to just acclimating to a new, a new role. But I'm very excited and as excited today as I was when I took the job. How do you think your political background, you know, three terms in Congress, will help you in navigating uh, this system? Because as you know, the, the legislature has a lot of oversight over the university system and, and that kind of thing. How do you think that prepares you for this? Because you, you got a session coming up, of course, starting in January, the first legislative session that you'll be dealing with. I think it's more than just the legislators. The, the individual citizens of North Dakota take a lot of ownership and pride in their universities. You know, not just the University of North Dakota and North Dakota State, but other universities across the state. And they all have a view as to how that should be run, what they should be doing together, what we should be investing in. And so I think it's absolutely vital that you have at least some sort of public experience to be leading a public university in a state that takes as much ownership in its universities as North Dakota does. So you think that'll help you when dealing in, with the Bismarck session? I've said it's not just a Bismarck session. If you look at a lot of the issues we've addressed already, they require a lot of engaging the public in a way that I've oftentimes said to myself, it's impossible for me to comprehend how you could effectively do this role if you didn't have at least some degree of public engagement in your past. Doesn't necessarily mean political office, but some form of public engagement. Okay, let's get to the budget cuts that have uh, impacted UND, mandated by the governor. Uh, former Governor Schaefer was the interim president. Uh, he implemented a lot of these. Take us through exactly what areas have been cut, will be cut, and where it goes from there. Well, we, we in the last couple of months under my tenure, had an additional uh, cut beyond what President Schaefer has. In that case, we, we spread it evenly. President Schaefer went through an accelerated process of trying to figure out where would be the most logical places to address. Uh, you know, it's hard to do that, period. It's even harder to do it in a short period of time, which is why I immediately launched a strategic planning process so that if we have to go through a third round with the new legislative session coming up, that we're prepared to think about what are the priorities, how do we invest in. Uh, so the we've tried to make sure we're protecting areas of strength. We've tried to make sure that we're continuing to deliver the quality of education for our students and research. Uh, we're working on one additional area right now, which is athletics. Mm -hmm. You know, we have 
even after cutting baseball, 20 sports. NDSU has 16. Most of our neighbors have 15 to 17. Yeah. It's really hard to field Division I competitive sports with that many sports. And so you'll be hearing in the weeks ahead uh, how we're making that adjustment. I'm committed to getting that done by November 1, by a decision from them by November 1, my decision days thereafter, so that we don't have this aura of uncertainty overhanging our athletic programs, which would hurt their recruiting. And, and this is the last time we're addressing athletics during my tenure because I'm committed to making sure that we're focused on uh -huh. championship teams, but we're going to have to take some further budget adjustments in order to do that. Which departments were hit the hardest, would you say? Uh, y y there's a range of people being hit by, you know, 8 to 12 to some more. Uh, I don't know that you can say that any one uh, department was hit greater than others in that they all shared in the sacrifice. Through my tenure it was evenly adjusted, but I don't know that any one department had an overweighted, yes, the range was not evenly split when you combine President Schaefer's uh, adjustments and the ones under my tenure, uh, but I don't think it was disproportionately any one or the other. What do you find is the morale on campus among professors and administrators? I mean, I know this has been painful, in your discussions, what's, has morale been affected, do you think? I think certainly during that period, you know, we took a survey during that period, right in the middle of the budget cuts, in the bitter, middle of the uncertainty as it relates to who's going to be the president. And we released that full survey. Uh, we would certainly hope, if we took a survey again in the future, that it would be above that. And I'm sensing a much more positive spirit as we're getting past that, as we're focusing on the future. I've always find that if you want to focus on the past, you can find ways of getting a concerned, upset, uh, distraught, but a focus on the joint future that we can achieve together uh, keeps us in a much more positive light. And, and that's what we're trying to do at the University of North Dakota. I'm gonna ask you to put your political hat on for a second, because you were in Congress for six mm -hmm. years, and if you can't answer this, that's fine, but a lot of this was mandated because of the oil price drop and the feeling that maybe North Dakota has been too dependent on energy when something like that happens, and it's these across the board cuts that came through the governor's office. What is your sense of that, too dependent on energy? Well, I think part of why you need the University of North Dakota right. as a cheap opportunity engine is to move beyond just agriculture and energy, and why I'm so excited about things like unmanned aircraft. Uh, we brought in between us and the air bases the, as the two big magnets, uh, companies like Northrop Grumman and General Atomics that show early promise of bringing more opportunity, more industry into this state. Have you met with sta state leaders yet? Uh, governor Dalrymple, you know, former Governor Schaefer, who I assume has been helpful to you as well. Uh, tell me about that so far. I I've met with uh, the last three or four governors, okay. uh, and I've met with n not all the legislators, but I've around my my travels around the state. I've hit a, a wide cross-section of legislators from both parties, and uh, we've met several of the people in the administration. So I'm working very hard, particularly during the early 90 days of my listening, to just understand their views, their concerns, their hopes, uh, their visions for where we can be together. Do you have any concerns, uh, you know, in, in this state in the last few years, there's been a lot of headbutting with the university system and state lawmakers. Uh, there are some state lawmakers that kind of view the university system in a negative way and higher education. Is that going to be an issue and do you sense that when you meet with some of them about how things have been handled with universities lately? Clearly the legislators want to make sure their dollars are being well spent and if you look at the, the rigorous approach that we have taken at University of North Dakota you know, Schaefer, President Schaefer was on the front edge of that uh, before the other universities. Uh, hopefully we've earned our spurs uh, in terms of spending the money we have efficiently and wisely. But uh, there is no doubt in my mind that when you think about that dependence on energy and agriculture, that the best opportunity for North Dakota is to invest in premier K through 12 and premier higher education to have uh, a top flight flagship like University of North Dakota, as well as a top flight land grant like NDSU, that can propel the state forward in ways that nothing else can. So even though there are some skeptics, mm -hmm. we, I, need to do a, a focused job on helping people understand the opportunity that higher education provides. 
with the legislative session that starts in January, what are you, what are UND's key priorities going in, or are you working on that right now? Well, first of all, we're going to work in a collaborative fashion within the NDUS, North Dakota University System. So if they're getting pushed and pulled from 11 different universities, we're not necessarily going to get the optimum result that we can working together. So we're committed to being a part of that effort. We have a number of capital requests that even if we're not going to get any any investment from the state, and I hope you know that I'll still say my prayers that we can, uh, we need to get authorization to build with donor funds. Also, uh, we have $500 million of deferred maintenance. That's four medical mm -hmm. schools with no ribbon cutting, just you know, new roofs, air conditioning, plumbing. Uh, we, we need to have an all hands on approach, which includes selling assets that aren't really core to our mission. That again requires a state approval. So we're gonna have a number of capital requests because this is there's only a session every two years. We can't wait around for another two years to address several of the needs that are, are remaining on campus. We're highly appreciative of the legislature and the government and the citizens stepping forward on our new medical school. It's gonna have a profound yep. impact on the state. The new law school is also very good. We have a new collaborative energy center and the new expansion of the core library that will help us continue to fuel the prosperity in the Bakken as well as work on climate issues. Uh, we've got a lot of new things, but our average age of our building is still 50 years old and we need to make sure we're addressing that. Then uh, the overall level of funding, uh, we, they've told us that we need to prepare for a 90% uh, of last biennium. Mm -hmm. We're at least three-fourths of the way there with the two rounds of cuts which we've already had to go through. There's some whispers of that might even be worse than that. I think people need to really take a step back and say how debilitating this is to the core fabric of the university system. There's only so much you can take before you truly are cutting into bone. And so trying to make the case that, you know, we ought to be thinking north in 90, not south in 90, if at all possible. And as we set the priorities for the state, uh, that's something we'll be making the case for. So it's going to be a difficult session, isn't it? It would be a very difficult session, you know. So. Uh, uh, I guess nobody promised me a bed of roses, <laughs> and there's no doubt that I haven't received well, it. Well, welcome to North Dakota, right? <laughs> welcome back. Um, let's quickly move to a couple other issues. Um, the transition to the Fighting Hawks, as the nickname and the logo, how do you think that is going so far? I think it's going remarkably well, and it's uh, going better than most people predicted, and it will continue to go well. I just went to my first uh, hockey game. Uh, as the president, and yes, you know, you're going to hear Sue after the mm -hmm. Star Spangled Banner. We probably will for at least another decade or two. <laughs> uh, and, uh, but you did it, and you had some, you know, Sue Forever chance at the beginning, but it wasn't prevalent throughout the game. You saw a lot of people wearing Hawk merchandise at the hockey game. When you go to a football game, I would say there's more Hawk than there is Sue. And this was in the first year. Uh, and so I, I think over time people are going to embrace the new name, the new logo, because they understand how we need to capture around something that we, we can cheer for and, and fight for. Um, but it's going to take time. And I think the winning tradition that, that we're seeing from Bubba with the football, the now ranked 24th in the nation, the winning tradition that we expect to continue in hockey, uh, will help us to engender people to the new logo. As far as you're concerned, is the Fighting Sioux uh, controversy in the rearview mirror now? Uh, you know, last year it probably wasn't. It seems like it's a little bit more now. And what are your thoughts on how this whole thing was handled by the NCAA, if you have any? Well, I, I don't know that I have thoughts as to how it was handled because I don't want to necessarily mm -hmm. retrade the right. past, but I can tell you that when I speak of the decades long conflict we had over this. It's evident to me every day that the distraction that that caused from the administration. So I'm getting served up issues that I'm saying, why wasn't this it's addressed two, two years ago, ago three right. years ago, five years ago? We have a, a, a website that is not mobile friendly. Uh, most academic institutions are well into having mobile friendly websites. People are looking for their, ca their school, applying for their schools, registering for classes on their mobile devices and ours is really more built for uh, a, a computer. Uh, that's something should have been done a long time ago. It's an example of things when you're distracted and focusing on mm -hmm. you know, what our name a is, nickname, right? you're not focused on that. And, and everybody loves to poo-poo uh, administrators in education and say we have too many of them and they cost too much. 
But when they're effective, they have an outsized impact. When they're distracted, it does impact the whole institutions. And, and when you talk about the morale being low, at least in part, it was the administration wasn't able to shine their full attention on the issues that are relevant to a university. And name is important, but it's, it's, right. it's not all important. And as a UND alumnus, I kind of felt that way as well, that there was more, uh, people were more upset about the nickname than they were about budget cuts. And that's what you're saying, there's more, you need to focus on what's truly important here. So I'm okay, they can wear, right. it's free right. country, you can wear whatever you want, <laughs> you can cheer whatever you want, just let me have the freedom of with my team focusing on the priorities for University of North Dakota and how we make it the premier flagship in the region. Mm -hmm. Okay, tell me about enrollment numbers this fall and how they're looking. Uh, enrollment, you, you may have seen we have a better quality student. We're down uh, just ever so slightly. Uh, we have a little bit more in graduate enrollment. Uh, and we're working, as I said during my interview process, first on quality. And then once we get that quality, you know, we may think about how we attract more students and whether we take in more of the demand we get. So uh, I think I'm concerned that this m marketing, this not having a mobile friendly website has impacted us. So we're rushing ahead to try to get what we call landing pages so that each program has a mm -hmm. nice attractive mobile friendly page that'll direct you to a mini site for recruiting. And I've also become a believer in digital advertising. We've done mostly paper advertising or billboard advertising, whereas digital advertising, at least in my past experiences, has been vitally important. So once we get those landing pages doing the digital and telling the good message that we have, we've had a couple of incidents, as you know, on campus that yep. cause people concerns. We gotta make sure that that isn't something that distracts the attention of, of what a great university this is. Um, but I think this, just highlights the need to double down your focus on marketing. What are what specifically is the enrollment number this fall, and what's an ideal number to be financially, you know, successful? I guess so what, our, do you, what do you see as a maximum number on, on campus? Our overall enrollment is, you know, it's where we might have been fourteen thousand eight hundred, we're maybe fourteen thousand six hundred now. I, I don't really have sure. the numbers committed ballpark, to memory, right. but it's and and it's still ballpark three thousand or so graduates uh, and 12,000 undergraduates. It's still ballpark, 3,000 online, 12,000 uh, face-to-face. Uh, those are comfortable numbers on our campus. We could take more. I'm actually thinking that there's a lot of growth in the, in the online space because we have a lot of great smart people that want to teach and are good at teaching in Grand Forks. We're not in Boca Raton, uh, Florida, so it's a little bit harder to get more people to come to Grand Forks, but we can teach them online and we have a great expertise in that. I also believe that there's growth opportunities in graduate programs. We have a lot of expertise areas that we really haven't pushed as much as we could. I think there's growth in the graduate areas. And in the undergraduate, we're in our, our fourth year of increased GPA, our fifth year of increased uh, ACT. And so we are growing the quality of that uh, undergraduate and we're gonna to continue to do that a while before we look to really grow it from the 12,000 or so that it's currently at. How do tuition rates compare at UND to other colleges in terms of a quality education or a good, a good deal for an education? Uh, we are at a, if anything, low. If you compare us just to our benchmarks, you know, in and around Dakotas, the, the two Dakotas and Montana and Wyoming, uh, relative to that average, we're certainly not high. We're perhaps $1,000. Uh, lower than others, and I, and, and we're well below uh, University of Minnesota even, or Wisconsin, so I think we're at the tuition level giving a very competitive value to our students. My focus on the cost side is to get them to a degree, because mm -hmm. if you've paid this money and you have a degree that you can go and then use for something and have a lifetime of employment, what you paid for college is small by comparison. If you only get part way through and you really didn't get a, a full set of skills that can help prepare you for the future, then what you paid, even if it was lower, uh, could perhaps not be a good value. So uh, I'm focused on making sure we deliver value with what we're delivering for the tuition that we charge in a way that brings more of our students to the full degree. 
Got about five minutes left. I want to hit a couple interesting personal things for you. You got a book coming out soon, I understand? I do. What is that about? It's uh, it's about how do you engage as a business with the political, the regulatory, the media, the activist groups that are out there. It, it's coming out in Columbia University, same university that Theodore Roosevelt went to law school in New York. It's called Shapeholders, Business Success in an Age of Activism. And so it'll be out next May, and I'm very much looking forward to that. That has been the focus of my academic uh, teaching and research, and it this the shapeholders is a new concept. It's saying, I think of a stakeholder, a uh, Greenpeace. The only stake they want in a coal company is the stake through their heart. So you can't really treat them as a stakeholder, but they can shape the opportunities available to the coal company. So the coal company needs to engage in, but it's differently, and that's what the book is all about. And you're also a member of the, on the Council of Foreign Relations. Can you tell me about that? It's an it's a, a elected role, mm -hmm. uh, and I'm honored to be part of it. It's the premier a foreign policy uh, organization in the country. I write often for Foreign Policy Magazine, and uh, I'm somebody who spent a lot of time around the world in, 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 as a congressman, as a businessman, as an academic. And we need to engage the world. If you think, why are we having lower oil prices? Is because growth in China fell, and Saudi Arabia is trying to squeeze out low, high-cost producers. We're being impacted by the world. We need to understand it. Uh, I spent a lot of time thinking about how is North Dakota's place in the world? How are we being impacted by it, and how we can impact it? And you're you're a founder of the Economic Club of Minnesota. Tell us what that's about. That's really the premier. Uh, speaking platform in this region. We went from zero to Ben Bernanke in 36 months. So we have seven to eight top flight speakers that have included the head of state. Uh, the head of state for Canada has been one of our speakers. We've had cabinet members both in this country as well as other countries. We've had heads of, of banks, not just the Federal Reserve Bank, but other national banks and uh, CEOs, leading thought leaders. So, we, for example, our next one will be Kevin Brady, who's the head of the Ways and Means Committee, that is the top tax rating and health care uh, committee in the Congress, as our next speaker. Uh, but uh, it, I'm, I'm, I'm hoping to talk a few North Dakotans into heading down there and experience it and maybe having some events up in North Dakota as well. Connecting the world to Minnesota and the region and Minnesota to them, I think, makes both better. Mm -hmm. I know in your bio I read you don't like to be in the office a lot. You like to get out and listen to people and be on campus and meet with people. Tell, tell me about that strategy and what that entails. If, if you follow uh, my Facebook or Twitter or uh, Instagram at Mark Kennedy UND, you'll see where I'm posting two or three different places. So I love going out and being in the units of our, of our school. I love going to the cafeteria and sitting down at a table with students and talking to them. I love going to our football and hockey and other games. I, I love getting as much input as I can around the state with coffees with Kennedy. And so that's really where I get the best input from the people, the best thumb on the pulse as to where we need to be taking the university. And so I'm not a big fan of spending my time in meetings filled with people mm -hmm. in conference rooms. I just as soon be out and about and getting their thoughts directly. Are you confident about North Dakota's economic and educational future and where do you see it going? I, I am confident, as I say, I'm, I'm even more optimistic about the role UND can play for the state and region, but it's going to take people understanding it. I was asked, I spoke to the Rotary in Grand Forks today, and they asked me, am I still excited about this, and I still think it's great. I says, yes, but I want to make sure we all do, because North Dakotans have that aw shucks, you know, we're mm -hmm. not that great. Uh, attitude. We're just North Dakota. We're not just North Dakota. We're an above average income state. We're the second largest oil producing state in the region. We've got uh, kids that have a better support network at home than just about any other part of, this, of the country. We ought to expect a lot of ourselves and we ought to know that education plays an important role in that. So upping our expectations, helping people understand the important role that higher ed plays in creating a better future for our children is got to be something I continue to focus on. Got about a minute left. If if there's a parent out there, they got a senior in high school, why, why the University of North Dakota? What is it that makes it special? What makes it special is that we have a very cohesive campus atmosphere. North Dakota alums love UND, and we have career tracks that are prepared for the future, that are really exciting growth areas that can put your child on a path to not just their successful first job, but with their liberal arts base, a lifetime careers. 
And the medical school is a huge part of it, right? Medical and the and the and the healthcare professions. There's a huge demand and need. Uh, we have some great instruction in that that are doing a uh, wonderful things. This is a, an innovative campus that has a long tradition of innovation history, and your your child will be well prepared to come out of the University of North Dakota with a degree in any of the number of range of programs we offer. Got about 30 seconds left if people want more information about UND. I know you're talking about easier to, ad, you know, the admissions process, getting that mobile. Where can they go? Who can they talk to? Well, it's und.edu is our website. Uh, my UND is all of our social media outlets. Uh, reach out to us. Uh, I don't have the individual yeah. uh, landing pages, but if you go to the they website, can, uh, they can find their way, and we would love to talk to them and, and make the case for why we're the best opportunity for them in creating their future. Mark Kennedy, thank you so much for being on Prairie Pulse. Good to be with you, man. Our guest today has been Mark Kennedy. He's the new president at the University of North Dakota. Thank you for watching Prairie Pulse, so long. Funding provided by the members of Prairie Public.